our closet. Um, on the back of the machine, there is a switch button that turns it on and off. You first just have to plug it in, and then you flip the switch to turn the machine on. Okay? It'll start loading and turn the monitor and the computers on. What's really nice is that this uh, monitor actually also moves um, so that like you're not cranking your head with the, like whatever the doctor's looking at. So it is movable. <clears throat> um, there are, for this purpose, there are three scopes that we commonly use. The first First one is this small, short one called the uh, bronchoscope. So this is for, obviously, to go down into the trachea, into the lungs. Um, I know it's more suitable for exotics because um, their pets are so small. And then we will also use this to look behind the nose, so retroflex rhinoscopy. Uh, we'll use that. This has a different hookup, which we'll obviously go over than our gastroscope and the colonoscope. The gastroscope, which is not here, um, it looks exactly like this. This is the colonoscope, but you can tell that this is extremely long and much thicker. Um, so this is, we do endoscopy on very large dogs, uh, but mostly we use this super long one for colonoscopies because we have to get all the way up through the colon. So it's very long. And again, the gastroscope looks exactly like this, but it's just a little bit shorter and thinner. That's the most common one that we use um, for foreign bodies, regular endoscopy. We don't ever really use that one to go up the butt because it's dirty. Okay. Once your computer is all set and turned on, if you pull this little drawer out, there's a little keyboard in here. And the first thing that you want to do is with the little touchpad mouse, hover over to the patient name, double click. You're gonna hit new. So now it's, you have a blank um, information setting here and you're gonna input what you need. So all you need is a last name, first name. And again, just like a keyboard, you can hit tab to move to the next line. We don't need a date of birth, we'll put the ID number, the doctor who's doing it, and the procedure. And then I like to choose if they're male or female. That's all you need. So last name, first name, ID number, the doctor, what are you doing? Um, and then like I said, I put the gender. Then you scroll down to select, and now your patient is active. So whatever procedure or pictures that you take is now gonna be under that patient that you input. It's important obviously with every procedure that you do that you just make sure that that patient's information is correct. The other big thing is because um, obviously there's different scopes and um, some of them require different adapters um, or cameras to get an actual picture. So there's two boxes here um, that have different video output devices. Um, one is called X-Link, and again, it's written on the boxes, and this is a much bigger piece opening. And then the next one is H3-Link, so it's a much smaller adapter. So it's important to double click on your display first, and you wanna make sure that your primary source is on the video output that you need, okay? So again, if you click on it, there's H3 or X-Link. These, the gastroscope and the colonoscope are gonna have big fat ends that look like this. And then there, there's gonna be a little top portion where you unscrew the top and it's gonna reveal the video camera port, okay? This is where this comes into hand. So again, and everything hooks up into one spot. You shouldn't be able to plug in something where it shouldn't. So as you can see, this piece is much wider. So this is gonna be your X-Link. Because again, it's only going to fit in this big piece here. 
You just want to snap it in. And then you're going to plug your camera or your scope in. Again, in this little piece here, there's two holes, this big hole and a small hole that's going to fit with these little metal ends here. And you're just going to put it in as it fits and it's just going to click in. Again, then our adapter, once you're all set and ready, once you plug this in, you can't get back in here, so it's important to put your patient information in first before you plug in the skull. And then again, there's a white dot on the video adapter that's going <clears> to <throat> match up. There should be a white dot at the top of the scope as well. So that's how you're going to plug in your video cord. So you just push it down and then theoretically a picture should show up again. Our video cord thing is broken right now. But if you're on <clears throat> if you're on X-Link, a picture should pop up and you'll know that your setup is correct. If you don't get a picture, most likely your display is, in, is incorrect because um, it's not going to give you a picture. Therefore, one of the first things you should know what to do is to switch your primary source because it's probably wrong. Um, and then to remove it, you just simply pull it out. No twisting and turning because that's how our pins broke. Um, but you literally just pull it out when you're done using the scope. Um, and then, again, we always like to cover our video output for cleaning. This is our light source box. Um, this is obviously how the light comes through to the scope so you can visualize what's happening. Um, again, these machines get hot. There's a light bulb in here that can burn out, so I turn on the light at the last minute, right when I'm about to start. Um, again, it's just simple with a turn of a button. And then there's a dial here that um, controls the brightness of the light. Um, again, at the end of every procedure, I like to turn it all the way off, again, to preserve the bulb. When I'm ready, I turn it all the way up so you can see there's a light now. <laughs> That's very bright. Um, before every procedure, you want to white balance it. I'm going to show you on the bronchoscope because, again, I can't do it right now on this one because our video adapter is broken. But you want to white balance it before the doctor goes down to do a scoping. So I'll turn that off. And then with every procedure, you also need insufflation and suction. This is where this box comes in. Um, it comes with a little bottle that you just fill up with the distilled water or the reverse osmolar water, which is the, we have one right here at this sink with a little black handle. You just fill it up as needed with that water. <clears throat> and then on this part of the scope, and it looks the same with the gastroscope, there's a little round open piece. That is where your suction and insufflation is gonna go. So you kind of just twist and push that on. So that's how it's gonna look. Your suction tubing is gonna attach to this ridged port here. And we just use an external suction uh, device to hook that up. And then again, to remove, you just twist and pull it off. Um, and then with the bronchoscope, we'll do that next. This one, as you can see, it's just the scope itself. Um, so we have to attach an external camera and light source to it. This is the suction button here. This is the channel where they can put instruments through. Sometimes you can suction through there too or whatnot or we'll flush or um, sometimes like in small animals that we can't fit. The end, any of the other scopes will do what we call a ghetto insufflation where we get a syringe with air and just keep inflating to open up the stomach or open up the area where we need to visualize. So we use this channel and there's a on and off little switch here. We're gonna hook the camera up to this top portion here and then our light source is gonna twist onto here. And then there's a little um, button here that moves up and down which turns the scope in two directions, okay? So with that, we need a different adapter. This is just the light source adapter that lives in the keyboard drawer here. This is gonna fit in the big hole in that part of the machine. 
Both of these are located in our room. This is the light source cable, so it's a great cable. Again, this is gonna hook up to the side of the bronchoscope. And then it's gonna just click into the light source cable. I'll change this to H3 link, so we'll get a picture. Our camera lives in this little box. Again, little camera piece here. Um, how to screw it on is that this black portion here, it's like a twist and release, so we have to twist it to open it to put it on the bronchoscope. So I'm gonna twist it open so I can sit it on top of the scope and then release, so now it's locked, okay? And then to remove it is the same thing. You twist to open it and, to, and then it's released off of the scope. <clears throat> so then your scope is all hooked up. We're gonna plug it into our H3 link. I like to remember H3 HD because this is an HD camera, so that's how I try to remember what camera goes to what. I'm gonna plug it in. And then if you're on the right setting, you're gonna get a picture right there. On the bronchoscope too, which I mean the, the doctor can do, but there's also two buttons that, um, that you can change to manipulate the picture and the zoom. So you can make the circle bigger or smaller. And then you can focus the picture better with the second button. Okay. Again, if we need to um, white balance, I'm going to turn my light on. I'm going to turn my light all the way up so, again, there's a light on this camera. And what you're going to do is point it against something white to white balance it. And how you do that is I pull the keyboard out. I'm going to hit enter. And that's going to pull up the little menu. And then there's the down, the, you know, the arrow keys on the keyboard. You're gonna hit down and hover over white balance. And once you're ready, you're hovering. I'm gonna hit enter. And it'll tell you if your white balance was okay or not. It'll tell you if it's wrong. And then you'll have to do it again. So now your scope is white balance. If you're setting up prior, and you're not doing your procedure for maybe like an hour or so, just turn the light down. If you turn it off, you've just, you, like you've reset the white balance. You have to do it all over again. So don't turn it off. Just turn the light down all, or all the way down um, so it doesn't get hot or burn out. So this scope is ready to be used. Again, we would just hook up an external suction device on this end um, if we needed to. Um, but that's about it for the setting up of the scoping. Um, the most important part prior to any type of scoping is to pressure or leak test all of the scopes before and after any procedure. You don't know what someone else has done in a prior procedure and also during a procedure if the doctor's too rough or it was a difficult foreign body or something like that. There's always possibility or risk that we could have caused damage um, to the scope. So when we go to clean it, we obviously don't want to submerge a broken scope so that the fluid gets into the channels and breaks all the wiring and everything like that. So two pressure tests. <clears throat> you want to make sure that um, everything is detached before you do anything. Um, so that's going to be your first step prior to any type of setting up for your scope. Starting to set up for an endoscopy, I would first hang up my scope. These are the natural ways that the scopes should hang. Um, I know it looks like it should be unstable and you need to like hang this over something, but this is how the scopes naturally hang. So this part is just going to hang down, your scope is going to hang down. If it's extra long, I just flip this over so it's not rubbing against the floor. In this bottom drawer here is where all the little sphygmometer things live. Um, there is a short one for the bronchoscope. 
There's a long, thinner one for the gastroscope, and then there is a long, thicker one for the colonoscope. So you just wanna use the one that fits best with the scope that you're using. Every single scope has this little piece where there's like two divots on the end here. And that's where you're gonna hook up your little sphygmometer piece. So on the sphygmometer, there's like a little notch um, where you line up with the circle and then you can twist it to lock it. So again, every, every scope has that on this one. It's this little piece with a long silver notch on it that you just line up the sphygmometer and then twist it to lock it. To pressure test, I like to hang it up naturally. <clears throat> I'm going to just empty it, make sure all my pressure is gone initially. And then I'm going to squeeze until I hit 200. And if you, you can over inflate over 200 and then just lower it down to 200. And then at 200, you're gonna flex the scope in all directions for a couple seconds to make sure that there's no hidden cracks or leaks where the pressure is losing. So I'm gonna flex my scope in one direction while I'm watching my sphygmometer and just making sure I'm not losing any pressure. If it goes down by like one notch, not a big deal. If it's like starting to steadily go down, that's when we worry. And then I'll just keep rechecking it to make sure that it's repeatable. If I'm happy where I'm at, I'm gonna to flip to the other direction and check for any leaks. Okay. Once I'm happy with that, I'm gonna relax my scope again. And now I'm gonna decrease my sphygmometer to 160. And this is where I let it sit for like a minute or two and see how much I've lost. Again, if it goes down by like little, one little line, not big of a deal, I'm not worried, but if you're noticing that it's like steadily going down or it's gone down a significant amount, redo it, recheck it, or have someone else recheck it um, before using the scope because there might be a leak. And this one I'll just show you. The bigger guys, I like, like you can just lay the part on a table. Again, lining up the notches with the sphygmometer and then twisting it to lock it on. <clears throat> Pumping up to 200. Okay. With these, the gastroscope and the colonoscope, there's two knobs here that turn the directions up and down, left and right. So again, we need to go in all directions. So I'm gonna turn my scope all the way in one direction while looking, making sure I'm not losing anything, turning the other direction. Okay, relaxing that one, now going to the second knob, turning in one direction. And again, opposite direction. So this one went down to 188. I'm not too concerned about that. That's pretty normal. If it went down to 180 or 185 or something like that, maybe I'd redo it and retest it. Once I'm happy, I'm going to decrease my pressure monitor to 160. And then this is usually where I'll like start setting up the table, like the wee pads down or whatever. So like you're not just waiting there staring at your scope. So while we were doing that, our bronchoscope has held at 160. So this means we are okay to use the scope. There's no leaks, no cracks. Um, so we are safe to use this. Again, once you're done with your procedure, you wanna repeat this process again in case you have caused some damage to the scope before submerging to clean it. When you're finished, you just press the button to release the pressure and then twist it off, pull it off. Put it in our drawer. There's um, the other cleaning supplies and syringes in this last drawer as well. <clears throat> Obviously, once you're done with the scoping, you just can start removing everything. I like to turn my insufflator off. I'm going to turn it on so you can see how loud it is. 
I turn this on when the pet is asleep and under anesthesia. His A, why do I need to hear this? And B, it's loud. It could be distracting to the pet. And again, the machines do get hot. So I don't turn things on until usually my pet is under anesthesia, especially this big thing. So say, you know, we're finished with the scope. Everything is attached. Um, the first step that you want to do if we're all hooked up and we're done scoping is that um, now we need to obviously first, you know, we have to clean it, we have to pressure test. Obviously, if it's a really busy day, we have a lot of stuff to do. It's important to uh, A, make your cleaning buckets, but what we like to call our suck, the suck and blow bucket, which is going to be your quick clean, okay? <clears throat> and this is what the doctor will do once they're done, once they've pulled out of whatever orifice that they were in. If you cannot clean the scope right away, it's a good practice for them to do that. And what they will do is it's just a rough cleaning of the inside, so they will suck up this clean water with just a tidge of cleaner solution in it to just flush out the excess debris that's within the scope, so that's not gonna get caked within the scope and damage the scope. Because um, again, there are times where we can't get to cleaning the scope right away. So it's very important that the doctor does the suck and blow um, initially. And what they would do is you just stick the tip of the scope in. And then, I think I pushed this one too far down. There's these two buttons on here. One is, I uh, forget which one is what. In that suction. First they would, and the reason why it's called suck and blow is because you have to suction for like a minute to suck out clean water through and suck out any debris that's in there. And then blowing, so we're using this insufflator, so this is gonna stay on to blow water out um, to clean the little tip of the insufflator because sometimes goo can get in there too. Um, and get stuck and then, you know, thus uh, leaving your insufflation um, not working for the future. So that's why you have to do both buttons to suck and blow. I'll do it for a few seconds, alternating the buttons just to make sure that I'm happy. You can obviously stare at your suction line to make sure it looks fairly clean. And then once you do that, you're okay to go for a few hours without doing the deep clean of the scope until you have a chance to do that. So they, they sucked and blowed while you're still waking up your pet or whatever. They can leave it hanging up. Once you're all done, you just detach all your ports from this portion of the scope itself, turn off all of your machines, then remove your port, and then again we're going to pressure test our scope. If it passes, then we can move forward with cleaning. We use this cleaner called Enzol. It's located in the big cabinet under the sink. Um, and then we have these two um, big buckets here. There's one that has like two black Sharpie lines on it to mark the two gallon line and the three gallon line. Um, and what you do is pump, one pump of cleaner per gallon of water. So if you're filling up to the two gallon line, you're gonna do two pumps of cleaner. If you're doing to the three gallon line, which I did, you're gonna do three pumps of cleaner. Um, that is the appropriate dilution. In the suck and blow bucket, you just do like a little baby squirt, just enough to um, make the water clean. Again, you're gonna use the distilled water port for the cleaner. Once you have your buckets cleaned or set up, you can take your scope and you've pressure tested, right? So you know that your scope is good. There's no leaks. We can now submerge this whole thing. As long as you have screwed the video port cap on tightly and you know that it's secure, it's not lopsided or whatever, this whole thing can safely go into the cleaner. What you wanna do is remove your buttons, open up your little cap of this button and also pull that off because again goo can get in here and all of the crevices so we want everything open <clears throat> just throw these in there throw the whole
go in. Again, everything, if you pressure test it, the whole scope can be submerged. You don't have to, you know, it is, it looks scary, right? Because it's a camera. And then from that drawer, for the colonoscope and the gastroscope, you're going to get these two ports. That this is going to hook up to that black piece that I took off with the little flap. And then this is where the buttons, or this hooks up to where you pull the buttons off. Okay. And this is going to clean the inside channels of the scope. For the bronchoscope, you just hook up a syringe to the port and just flush it out. And then what I'll do is um, after a couple flushes, I'll fill up my cleaner again, hook it on, and then flush like partially so that there's a vacuum seal now and there's the cleaner sitting and stuck inside of the channel to help break down and disinfect the inside of the channel. Um, the max that these scopes can sit in the cleaner is a half an hour. So if you're busy, set a timer because more than a half an hour, the cleaner starts breaking down the plastic of the scopes, thus causing further damage. So you don't want to leave them in forever. Once you're done with this one, I just flush it, empty it through, let it run. These, just pull it out again just to show you. But again, it can be completely submerged. Again, these are going to coincide to where you took your buttons off. So the big piece is going to go onto the big piece. Oh, and wear gloves because it is it could be a carcinogen. Plug it in. And then this piece is going to go onto here. Oh my god, now my hands are slippery. So that's how it's going to look. And then again, you take your syringes, fill them up with your cleaner, hook them up to your little hoses, and then I flush each port two to three times. And the last flush, again with this one, I, ins I flush through partially, leave some cleaner in so that I've created a vacuum seal and that cleaner is sitting within the scope. Again, max half an hour. Once we are done, it's sat um, while it's sitting or once you're done, your 30 minutes is up cleaning, I'll take a gauze and wipe down the scope with the gauze just to wipe off any excess saliva or anything like that. You're going to wipe your tip off, again, because there's schmoo everywhere. And even the handle too, because the doctors get dirty if they're touching a bunch of stuff. This handle can get a little sticky and dirty too. So we want to get a gauze and wipe that down. Now we're done with the uh, letting the fluid disinfect. So we're going to pull these off. And even with gloves on, it's slippery. So it uh, takes some finagling. Okay. Then we have these blue little brushes um, that we're going to, it's going to be the top red hole. Um, the gastroscope, you can um, go in two different directions, um, but this one I think it only goes through one. Let me just double check it. Yeah. So. For the gastroscope, you're going to go in two different directions. 1A, your brush is going to come out through here and come out of your suction port. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain, but you have to aim up and to the right to make it go through the suction channel. The other direction, you're going to aim down and like to the left, and you're going to come out of your actual scope. So I'll show you that. The other way you can go down is through, it works on the gastroscope. This one is being a little difficult 
um, but the other way that you can go down the scope is going through the actual instrument channel. And you want to do slow, short feedings through the scope because again, we don't want to scratch the inside. But this is now scrubbing the inside of your scope channel. This might not, oh, there it goes. So now I'm out. Whee! Again, then when I'm out, just with the gauze or something, wipe the tip off so you're not dragging whatever you've scrubbed out back into the scope. And again, slow strokes back out until you're out. Again, do that two times or so, two to three times just to scrub everything through. Okay. Once you're all done and you're happy with that, depending on the procedure, like if it's a quick gastric form body, you know, usually I don't need to soak it for a full half an hour because it's quick, it's fairly clean, like not a lot of schmoo came through, whatever. If I'm doing a colonoscopy or like a bird where they're gross, I'm definitely letting that sit in for a half an hour because it smells and it's disgusting. So once you have scrubbed the inside, you flushed it and disinfect, you take everything off and then you're just going to move it to your rinse bucket. And this one is much quicker where you just have to attach these on again and flush through a few times with the plain water or the distilled water flush through. Again with the gauze, I'll wipe it down again. And then once you're done, you hang it up to dry. I like to, again, you want to lay it in its natural position so that everything can dry appropriately. So again, that solution is going to fall down, the water is going to evaporate. Um, you can, on instance, like rarely I'll inject or flush through alcohol. That should help like dry out the inside if you need to. Most of the time it's not necessary, but that is an option. If you need to quickly clean and you need it dry right away, like you can. Obviously this one is very long, it can get in the way, someone can step on it. You can flush alcohol through with the, um, with the little attachments to flush alcohol through the whole system just so it could dry out quicker. But otherwise this is fair enough, just hanging the scopes in its natural position to just like gravity take over and let all the water rinse out. Um, and then you're done with the scope and the cleaning. If you're moving on to another scope right away, um, it's okay to move forward with the next, next scope even though this may still be wet or something because remember, we've protected this portion, the video camera that needs to be dry. You can take a gauze and just dry this portion off. Um, so that's what I would probably do, but it is ready to move forward onto a next scoping. Um, I think for this purpose, I think that's it. I may not go into the rigid scopes because that's more um, like we just use them for rhinoscopy or cystoscopy, but these are the scopes that we mostly use commonly, more than anything. Um, so that's it, I think.